Hey there, it's Brandon Robertson here, and I wanted to take a moment to tell you about my new book, The Gospel of Inclusion, A Christian Case for LGBT Inclusion in the Church. You know, over the years that I've been engaging in this topic of LGBT and queer theology and making the case for LGBT inclusion from a biblical Christian perspective, I've become really disillusioned by so many of the arguments made by so many friends and scholars that I really respect and have helped me on my journey, but that center specifically around reinterpreting six particular passages in the Bible that seem to talk about homosexuality and the belief that once we get a more inclusive interpretation of those six passages based on culture and context, that the rest of our theology can stay the same and we can create an LGBT inclusive church. For me, that wasn't my experience. One, I didn't find very many of the arguments on either the affirming or the non-affirming side really convincing or conclusive when we talked about the culture and the context and authorial intent of the six clobber passages of the Bible. I think there are strong cases to be made on both a traditionalist and on a revisionist perspective on many of the verses in scripture. For me, what began to shift my perspective on LGBT inclusion from a biblical lens was when I began to understand that from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, there is a consistent trajectory in scripture towards a more radical and inclusive posture. There's a consistent trajectory to raise the ethics of the people for whom scripture is given to. A raising of the ethics that calls people to be more selfless, more loving, more like Christ. In Genesis, we see some very low ethics, ethics we might look back on today and judge as far below our standards. And by the time we get to Revelation, we see this beautiful image of every nation, tribe, people, sexuality, and gender standing before the throne of God on equal footing. There is this redemptive trajectory that God has set forth in creation that has the end goal of redeeming and reconciling all people in all of our diversity to God. The other thing I noticed as I studied both the culture, the context, and hermeneutical approaches to scripture is that in this redemptive trajectory from the beginning of the Bible to the end of it, there is also a consistent uh, attack, I would say, on patriarchal systems and structuring of society and of the church. In the beginning of the Bible, we see a clear patriarchal culture reflected in the writing of scripture. But by the time we see Jesus arrive on the scene, we get the image of a radical rabbi who's challenging cultural norms and long-held beliefs and practices that would subjugate women, that would subjugate socioeconomic minorities, that would subjugate sexual and gender minorities. We see Jesus challenging these, raising the standard. And this gets Jesus into a lot of trouble. Even some of his disciples aren't quite ready for the radical revolution of ethics that Jesus was bringing. And Jesus promised that after he ascended into heaven, he would send his spirit to continue to reveal more truth to his disciples, meaning that the fullness of truth had not yet been revealed. The direction that Jesus began pointing the ethics of Christians was towards the deconstruction of patriarchy and the liberation of all those who patriarchy has oppressed for generations. When you begin to see scripture in this lens, when you begin to see that there's more going on beyond the literal words of scripture, when you begin to grasp the culture and the context from which scripture emerged and you begin to see the ethical picture, the artistry of the authors from Genesis to Revelation and how God has beautifully and faithfully worked through human history to raise our standards and to bring us to a more inclusive posture, everything changes. My entire Christian faith changed when I discovered this. See, I don't believe that interpreting six passages differently is what is needed. I think a complete reinterpretation of Christian faith, a new understanding of what it means to follow Jesus is what's necessary. And no aspect of our theology can remain unexamined and untouched by this exploration. In the Gospel of Inclusion, I lay out a case historically, contextually, and theologically for a radically inclusive reading of scripture 
and a radical lens to view the Christian faith as ultimately pointing to inclusion and acceptance for all. I hope you'll go over to Amazon.com and pick up a copy of The Gospel of Inclusion, A Christian Case for LGBT Inclusion in the Church. I'm honored to have the foreword written by one of the world's leading Christian ethicists, Dr. David Gushy, and he has written some amazing, inspiring, and encouraging words in the beginning of the book. And I think that this book will be a resource for those that are interested in queer theology and a queer case for inclusion, but also those who are interested in getting to know what the Bible has taught and what the culture from which the Bible has emerged taught about sexuality and gender. That's part of the funnest part of this project, was digging in deeply to the cultural context, finding manuscripts and writings and records of sexual and gender minorities in the first century and beyond. This book is meant to be accessible, it's meant to be thought-provoking, it's meant to be challenging, and I hope it's meant to be healing and liberating, especially for those of us in the LGBT community who have known in the depths of our being for a long time that God has a place for us in the church. Again, I hope you go and pick up a copy of The Gospel of Inclusion, A Christian Case for LGBT Inclusion in the Church, published by Cascade Books, available now at whippinstock.com, on Amazon, and wherever books are sold.